Amen. All right. All right. Welcome to Old First, everyone. Really glad you are here. Uh, remember, this is the best hour of your week, or at least it should be, where we worship the Lord. Uh, we do have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first, in your bulletins is a Vacation Bible School um, information. Okay. The date is in your bulletin, but we do need helpers in various areas, and there's a sign up sheet out there in the uh, foyer that you can sign up. So we need a lot of different helpers in a lot of different areas, and um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And the theme is great. It's from Answers in Genesis, and they do a lot of good stuff. And so uh, if you can help with Vacation Bible School, please uh, see Miss Karen, all right, or sign up over there, okay? All right, a couple other things. Uh, thank you very much, but uh, preteen camp is fully funded, all right, from our dessert auction. And so, yeah, I think, uh, let's see, uh, Misty, we're taking how many? Six to pre-team camp, which is a great, a great number. And uh, so thank you so much for, for buying the decorations that students made and, and for uh, the great cake auction. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we just never done that before. And so we had a lot of fun doing that. And uh, but that leads me to youth camp. You can still rent a kid, okay, and uh, use them uh, for different things. Which, uh, which I got to I forgot, I got to write a check for some work some guys did. So remind me of that, Miss Anna. But, um, but they're gonna, what they're going to do now is a, a cookie jar fundraiser. All right, so they're going to make some cookies, put them in a really nice jar, and then you can, uh, you can donate and receive that and uh, help, help fully fund youth camp as well. And uh, we're hoping to take around 10 or 12. So it's going to be a good summer. Uh, there's other things in the uh, bulletin you can look at. We'll announce as, as we get closer to those things. But uh, let's now come to our call to worship, and we'll be in Psalm 104. 
Psalm 104, a little bit lengthy, but it's a beautiful psalm, so I didn't want to cut it off. And uh, let's just uh, enjoy this wonderful psalm today, Psalm 104. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. This is the word of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You were clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They drink, they give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Notice all the beautiful imagery here. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, and rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. We just saw that this past week. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness, and and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. Oh, Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships. And Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. They all look to you and to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your faith, they are faced, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in His works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. So what should we do? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to Him For I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Let's raise our hands in a posture of prayer this morning. Lord God, we know that all the earth and everything in it belongs to You. Everything is created to bring You glory. So may we bring You glory today as we lift up our voices in song, as we hear the preaching of the Word. We love you. We praise you. All glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's all remain standing for our first song.
Well, praise the Lord. It's so good to see you this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And I want you to just praise the Lord as you sing this morning, would you? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been there forever, yes, sing it. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in the courses above. Join with all nature with manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy. Oh, yes. Great is, thank you, Lord Jesus. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning, oh yes, mercies I see. All I have needed and have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. Pardon for sin and peace that endure Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow Blessings all mine with ten thousand Oh, just think about it Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning to morning, new mercies I see. Oh yes, that thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. He is here, hallelujah. He is here, amen. He is here, holy, holy. I will bless his name. He's here this morning. He is here. Listen closely. Hear him calling out your name. He is here. You can touch him. You will never be the same. You may be seated. Brother Doug, you come sing for us, my friend. Second Peter 5, 9 says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to redemption. I believe that if it had just been for one person, if it had just been for me or for you, that Jesus would have come and sacrificed so that we could have eternal life. Listen to this great song by the late, great Dottie Rambo. For what earthly reason did 
the heavenly Father send down His Son to suffer rejection and pay for crimes He had not done. For what earthly reason did the fathers let him hang on a tree? I wept with the answer that one earthly reason was me.
How is everyone doing today? Good. Right. Well, um, without looking at the screen, <laughs> all right, who can tell me your question from this past week? Right. Very good. Yes. <laughs> we, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, we can put it back on the screen now. All right. Yeah. So our question this week was, can anyone go to heaven with their sinful nature? All right. And what was the answer? Yes, ma'am. Let's say it again. Yeah. Yeah. Very close. All right. Very close. Yeah, very, very close. All right. Yeah, very good. See, if you can hear the kids, they're talking about our heart needs to be changed. All right. So the answer that you went over was no, our heart must be changed before we can be fit. Right. That means acceptable to or for heaven. One more time. No, our heart must be changed before we can be fit for heaven. All right. So let's ask that. Can anyone go to heaven with their sinful nature? All right, we got we got to practice that again. All right, let me tell you again. We'll all say it together. No, our heart must be changed before we can be fit for heaven. Let's practice that. No, our heart must be changed before we can be fit for heaven. All right, can anyone go to heaven with their sinful nature? All right, good. I think we got it. All right. But guys, yeah, that's kind of a long answer, but it's wonderful truth here because we can't go to heaven in our sin, all right? We must be born again. Our hearts must be changed. So I want to read to you from John chapter 3. We all know this text from Jesus and Nicodemus. So Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, we must be born again. Our old sinful selves must die, and we must be born again into a new, beautiful creation covered with the righteousness of Jesus. And how do we do that? Call upon sins, right? And for us to follow him the rest of our days as our Lord and Savior. Okay? So keep learning, keep growing, and I hope everybody here is born again. All right? If you're not, perfect day for that to happen. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. Thank you for these children. May they keep learning and growing and remembering they must be born again. Because no one in their sin will be able to enter into your presence. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll come to our memory verse for the month. And um, it's Psalm 27.1. And I picked this because just we can, we can look at the news just like last night. We can have a lot of fear. Uh, but when we're in Christ, we have no reason to fear because the Lord is our light and our salvation. So let's all stand as we read Psalm 27.1 together. All right, here we go. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Amen. Let's now come to our time of prayer. And, and yes, this morning, let's pray uh, for Israel, the Middle East. Um, we're all aware of what's happening or what happened last night. Lord God, the news reminds us there's evil all around us. There's wickedness there are many, many lost people doing lost people things. We look to the Middle East and we see 
false religion, attacking another religion that have not followed Christ. Both of these people need Christ. People need to turn away from Muhammad and follow Jesus. People need to, in Israel, need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And if both Jew and Muslim will throw away their false beliefs, and embrace Christ. That is the answer to peace. So God, in the midst of all of these evil things, work, bring people to faith, may evil not win, but may your kingdom expand greatly in the Middle East. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want you to sing it with me already. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord, singing, Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of Ushers, come forward as we sing it again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands, one accord, singing, Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord.
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much. You know, I don't know. Well, I do know this to be a fact. Every, every one of us, every one of us, pastor, all have a need here today. Somewhere in our spirit, there's a need. Somewhere in our circumstances, there's a need. There's not one person here this morning that is exempt from that particular situation. But in the presence of Jehovah, in his magnificent presence, he is here to heal those needs and to provide those needs. Just relax in the Lord and I want you to sing this with me. In the presence of Jehovah. Just put your mind on him this morning. Oh yes. In the presence of Jehovah God Almighty Prince of Peace Troubles vanish Troubles vanish Hearts are mended Hearts are mended In the presence of Oh yes, I want you to just listen to him as he speaks to you In the presence Oh, he's here this morning of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, Troubles vanish, hearts are me. sing before our message. All right, well, grace and peace to you this morning. Just really glad that we are all here gathered on this Lord's Day. And um, this morning, we're finally back in our study through Ephesians after taking some time off. And if you will remember, we are in part two of Ephesians. And uh, Paul here has been giving us instructions for how we are to live the Christian life. All right, so part one, Basically, he was telling us how to become Christians, and then in part two, he's telling us how do we live the Christian life. And what he's been, we, what we've been talking about is growing in sanctification, right? Growing in Christ likeness. We are to repent of sin, we are to renew our minds, and we are to put on God's holiness each and every day. We are to strive to become more and more like Jesus. Amen? So those are the things we've been talking about. Well, as we arrive at our text for this morning, we will see that becoming more like Jesus or growing in sanctification means to walk and live in the wisdom of God. All right? To walk and live in the wisdom of God. So as Christians, we are not to be foolish in our thinking or in our actions, but we are to embrace God's wisdom and live wisely. We look around at our world. We see lots of foolishness. And so it's important that we know how to live in God's wisdom. So with that in mind, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll be in verses 15 through 17 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. And let's all stand for the reading of God's word. 
This is the word of the living and true God. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, may we hear these words this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we think about our text this morning, the first thing that we need to do is think about the subject of wisdom. What is wisdom? How should we define wisdom? Well, the dictionary defines wisdom as this. It is the ability to use your knowledge and experience to make a good decision and to have sound judgment. Or we can say it like this, quite simply, wisdom is knowledge that is applied. Wisdom is knowledge that is applied. All right, so there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge. A person may know a bunch of facts. They may know a great many things, but if they are not applying it to their life, then, then what does that mean? Well, it means they can be quite foolish. Very smart, foolish person. They know things, but they're not applying it. Well, to help us see the difference between knowledge and wisdom, let me give you a few examples. When you are driving your car and the light turns red, right? Knowledge tells you to stop. Luca knows red means stop, right? That's knowledge. But wisdom is when you apply the brake. Well, what about something else? When a person has memorized the Ten Commandments, that's knowledge, we should know that. But it's wisdom when you actually obey the commandments. One more. We see this a lot. A person may know a bunch of facts about Jesus. They may know a bunch of Bible stories, but that doesn't really mean that they're following him. So then, right, that's knowledge, but it's wisdom to actually believe and follow and trust in Jesus for salvation. And so you see, wisdom is knowing the right thing to do and actually doing it. It's putting knowledge into practice. And of course, that is what we must do as Christians. Amen? We should not just learn a bunch of things about the Bible, about the Word of God, even though we should, right? We shouldn't just learn it and then that be it. But we are learning to, de to then apply it to our lives. Well, the next thing to keep in mind about wisdom is this. As Christians, we are called to, in, to not embrace, right? We are called to not embrace the so-called wisdom of this world, but we are called to embrace God's wisdom. Oh, and there's a difference. Listen to these two scripture references that describe the difference. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world, the lost world, is folly or foolishness with God. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, very good text here. He says, For the word of the cross is folly, it's foolishness, to those who are perishing, to the lost. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who was wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Listen here. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, right? not through Greek philosophy and things like that. It pleased God through the folly. He's using some irony here and some sarcasm. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, 
both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Listen to this ironic and a bit sarcastic statement. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Right? So you see here, the the sinful world has its so-called wisdom. But in reality, it's foolish compared to the awesome wisdom of God. Think about the world's wisdom. It's arbitrary, meaning that it's based on personal feelings and and whims that can change at any time. The world's wisdom is derived from people who are still spiritually dead in their sins. The world's wisdom has created our current culture where there is so much confusion right now about gender and identity. Overall, the world's wisdom is every man doing what is right in his own eyes. But praise God, there's going to come a day when the world's wisdom, that foolishness, will pass away. So as Christians, we should want nothing to do with the foolishness of the so-called wisdom of this world. Think about God's wisdom. God's wisdom is perfect. It's true. God's wisdom is not based on feelings and ever-changing whims. It is not arbitrary. It is a firm foundation that will never change. God's wisdom is beautiful. It's clear. It's the source of happiness and hope in this life. God's wisdom actually gives us guidance for how to rebuild our society that has been destroyed by man's wisdom. And as Christians... We need to pursue and love and cherish the wisdom of God. And we need to reject the foolish wisdom that comes from the lost world. Amen? Amen? Are we awake? With those things in mind, let's look again at our text. In verse 15, Paul says, Look carefully then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Well, in verse 15, Paul, he's telling the Ephesians, he's telling us to look carefully how we walk. And and what does this mean? This means that we need to closely examine our lives, right? We need to look at every area of our life and make sure that we are living how God wants us to live. So we, we look at, we examine our thought life. Right? We, we, look at and make sh- we look at how we speak about things. We, we look at, you know, how do we react to the circumstances around us. We look at our entertainment, our hobbies, our careers, and we ask ourselves, how is my faith? How is my Christian faith impacting these areas? Am I living out my faith in all of these areas? Am I staying away from sin in these areas? Am I being the person that God wants me to be in in all the different things in my life? We look carefully how we're walking, how we're living. And if we examine ourselves and we see there's an area where we are not living how God wants us to do, what, what do we do as Christians? We repent. We ask for God's forgiveness. And then we strive to obey God more carefully in that area of life. And then what do we do? We just we walk away in the joy of forgiveness. Knowing that God's forgiven us. So why do we need to do this? Why should we carefully examine our life in this manner? We do this because as Christians, we need to live consistent with our new identity in Christ. Who are we? We are the children of God. We have been saved. So then we should live like the people of God, right? We should live like the people that God has made us to be in Christ. We are to no longer live like the non-Christian around us and engage in all of his sin and foolishness. And we've seen this. 
As we've been going through Ephesians, we've seen this over and over. Paul has been telling us these things over and over. And maybe you're wondering, hey, why do we need to keep hearing about this? Why should I constantly be reminded to stay away from sin and to live a life of obedience to God? Why, why does he keep repeating himself? And the answer is this. We need this constant reminder because it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to forget. What does the old hymn say? We are all prone to, we know it, prone to wonder. Right? Not wonder about something, but stray off the path to engage in sin. And so we need to be constantly reminded to live a life that is consistent with our new life in Christ. We should remind ourselves every day. We should preach to ourselves every day to no longer live like the non-Christian. We've been changed. We've been brought from death to life. And now we need to live consistent with that change. That's the first part of the verse. As we look at the second part of the verse, 15, we see Paul describe further what our Christian lives should look like, and he describes it as one of wisdom. And so he says we should live not as unwise, but as wise. But with this phrase, we see that it is our joyful responsibility to walk in the wisdom of God and not in the foolishness of this world. How do we do that? We obey God's commands, right? We walk in holiness. We, and, and when we do those things, guess what else we're doing? We are living in wisdom. But what happens when we're not obeying God's commands? When we are living sinfully, then what are we doing? Well, we're living in foolishness. We are living inconsistent with the new creation that God has made us to be. And if you remember from chapter 4, how does Paul describe the unsaved life? Well, he describes it as a life of foolishness. And the reason that the unsaved life, the unregenerate life, the, the non-born again life, the reason why it's foolish is because it, it's a road to death and destruction. Right? It doesn't mean they're not smart. It doesn't mean you can't be smart and, and unsaved. It just means that you are unwise because you're walking to the road to destruction. But what happens when God saves us? Oh, He takes us off the road of foolishness. He places us on the road of wisdom and life. And we didn't get there on our own. We didn't work our way to that road. No, He put us there as a wonderful gift of His love and grace. So you see, as Christians, right, since we've been put on this road of wisdom and life, there is no reason then to go hang out on the road that leads to death and foolishness and sinfulness. Amen? And so when Paul says here, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, he's saying this, don't live in the foolishness of the unbeliever, but live in the wisdom of the God who has redeemed you. Don't live in the foolishness of the unbeliever. Don't want to be there. Not if you're a new creation. So how do we do this in our lives? We apply God's Word and His wisdom to every area of our life. We apply God's wisdom to our marriages. We apply God's wisdom to our how we raise our children, grandchildren. We apply it to our finances. Any other issue you can think of? And, and, and ask yourself this question, why should we go to the world's wisdom to get help with these things? Why would we go to a greedy unbeliever who worships his money to give us financial advice? You think we get good financial advice? No. Does a non-Christian counselor 
who embraces the ungodly philosophies of this world actually help our marriages or actually help us with other problems that we may have? No. So then what does help us? What do we really need? Well, since we're Christians, what we really need is a faithful brother or sister who may be a doctor or a counselor or something like that. Right? We need a faithful brother or sister who can help us to faithfully apply the wisdom found in God's Word. We don't run to the world and its foolish philosophies to help us. We have the help we need. So then, brothers and sisters, let's resolve to walk in the wisdom of our new life in Christ. And let's not play around with the foolishness of the former unbelieving life. Well, so after Paul calls us to walk in wisdom... In our next verse, we see that when we walk in wisdom, we are doing something else, and that is we are making the best use of our time on this earth. Here are are verses 15 and 16 together. Paul says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Well, here we see that walking in wisdom Right? Applying God's Word to our life means that we're doing something else. We are, we are making the best use of our time. Or as some translations you have may say, we redeem the time or we make the most of every opportunity. And if we're honest with ourselves, oh, our time can be used in wise ways or our times can be used in foolish ways. What happens when we use our time in foolish ways? We waste it. We can never get it back. Those hours are gone, never to be retrieved. And you know exactly how this feels if you have some type of TV streaming service. You know where this is going. We're tired. We need to rest. We sit down and watch a show. That's good. It's okay to do that. We need rest. That one show turns into two, two turns into three, three turns into four, and then sure enough, our whole day is spent in front of this TV being entertained, and if we're honest, we can say that was not a very good use of our time, right? We were not very productive. We did not make the best use of our time on that day. 